National Foster Care Specialist for the Children's Bureau, where I have the pleasure of leading the National Foster Care Month initiative each year in May. On behalf of the Children's Bureau, we welcome you to supporting permanency for LGBTQ youth in foster care. Before we get started, our operator, Paula, will cover the logistics for today's webinar. Thank you, Ms. Campaign. I will explain a few of the audio and video capabilities for this webinar. We will leave time at the end of the presentation for questions. You can ask a question using the chat feature. In the control panel, at the top right corner of your screen, there is a feature that allows you to raise your hand if you want to be recognized or type a question in the chat box. Feel free to use those features at any time. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and we will be available on the National Foster Care Month website in a few weeks. If we don't get to your question, we will provide a document that provides answers to the most frequently asked questions submitted during this webinar. This Q&A document will be posted on the National Foster Care Month website along with today's PowerPoint presentation. Now I'll turn the meeting back over to Ms. Campaign. Thank you, Paula. So let's talk about today's objectives for the webinar. Uh, this is to promote and support safety, permanency, and improve well-being for LGBTQ youth in care. And there are four particular highlights to today's webinar. First is effective engagement and welcoming strategies for the youth, caregivers, and the state agencies. We'll also talk about the importance of providing appropriate services to support permanency and connections for LGBTQ youth. We'll also talk about the importance of initial and ongoing individual assessments that include the youth in those. And we'll also provide you some helpful resources um, that will support that, those that are working with this population. So today's presenters include from the Child Welfare Capacity Building Collaborative at the Center for State. Emily Brunel, she's a youth consultant. She's also an alumni from foster care, and she'll give us her insights in better understanding what is important in working with LGBTQ children and youth. We also have Lisa Parrish, the project director at the LA or Los Angeles LGBTQ Center, and this is a Children's Bureau discretionary grantee. We'll also hear from Juliana Harms, the Administrator of Social Work Practice at the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services, and she'll speak from the perspective of a state child welfare agency's focus on achieving permanency and promoting a sense of community and connections for youth who identify as LGBTQ. The 2015 uh, National Foster Care Month Initiative, and I just want to give you a little bit of background, is a collaborative effort of the Children's Bureau, the Child Welfare Information Gateway, and numerous partnerships that we have with federal, state, and local agencies, organizations, associations, and numerous systems that are involved with youth and families. We also provide a website that offers targeted information for youth, caregivers, and professionals, uh, and also for the community. And we focus on supporting and achieving permanency for children and youth involved in foster care. In addition, we sponsor webinars, participate in local events, and with our various partners, promote the campaign through publications, blogs, and also social media activities. So here we have the National Foster Care Month uh, homepage. This is the uh, homepage for our initiative on the Child Welfare Information Gateway. And this year's theme is Get to Know the Many Faces of Foster Care and highlights the diversity of the children, youth, and families, and professionals um, that all are involved in child welfare. We draw attention to the fact that the definition of permanency is just as diverse as the people involved. Permanency, of course, can mean reunification, kinship care, guardianship, adoptions, uh, and key is the opportunity for lifelong permanent connections. The site also provides resources about, for example, how to plan for the appropriate placement of children and youth, including youth who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning. 
also pregnant and parenting, and tribal youth. Resources also highlight the efforts to to reduce the long-term placement of children in out-of-home care. So to talk a little bit about uh, today's webinar and our particular focus, uh, we are focusing, of course, on LGBTQ youth in foster care. And as noted here, there are approximately 182,000 youth ages 10 to 18 in foster care in the United States. And conservative estimates provide that an estimated 5 to 10 percent are LGBTQ. So like all other young people in care, um, LGBTQ youth need individualized supports and services, and they also need to be a part of determining what are the right supports and services for them. The supports really begin with connecting them with a nurturing family to help them feel safe and protected, to negotiate adolescence like all youth need that support, and to support their identity and grow into healthy adults. I just want to briefly touch over a few of the federal supports. Uh, there are really many, too many to name here, but just to highlight a few. Um, in terms of the White House, for example, in the President's Proclamation for National Foster Care Month, which you can find uh, on our website, on our Foster Care Month website, he stated that all young people, regardless of what they look like, which religion they follow, who they love, or the gender they identify with, deserve the chance to dream and grow in a loving, permanent home. Also in the proclamation, the president stated, with so many children waiting for loving homes, it is important to ensure all qualified caregivers have the opportunity to serve as foster or adoptive parents regardless of race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status. And in addition, earlier this year, the president historically acknowledged transgender and bisexual people in the State of the Union address. The Department of Health and Human Services also provides a number of supportive events, activities, and publications uh, for this particular population. So this year, for example, HHS, short term for Health and Human Services, will be sponsoring an LGBT Pride Month event for the staff in June, and it will focus on LGBT families. Also, in response to the President's directive in April of 2010 to identify steps the Department could take to improve the health and well-being of the LGBT community, the Secretary of the Department set up a department-wide LGBT Issues Coordinating Committee, which publishes an annual report on both notable accomplishments from the past year, but also highlights our objectives for this coming year with respect to the LGBT community. And information on accessing the Advancing LGBT Health and Well-Being LGBT Issues Coordinating Committee 2014 report we will provide that uh, information on how to access that at the end of the presentation. Now, under the Department of Health and Human Services is also the Administration for Children and Families. And in January of 2015, the Administration for Children and Families, I'll call ACF for short, published a report for the research development uh, by the Research Development Project on the Human Services Needs of LGBT Populations. And that report explores our current understanding of the human service needs of low-income and at-risk LGBT people in their interactions with human services, especially those that are funded by ACF. And it also identifies important topics for further research in this area. And information on accessing this report will also be provided at the end of the presentation. Again, that's a small overview of some of the uh, key publications and other resources and information that we have uh, through the federal government to support this effort. So with that, and more importantly, I'd really like to turn this over to Emmy. Hello, my name is Emmy Zanel. I am a young adult consultant with the National Capacity Building Center for the States at ICF International. And I'm here today to 
um, represent youth voice and share my story as well as important things to understand about supporting LGBTQ youth in foster care. I am a foster youth alumni from Wyoming. I spent my time in care there for about three years. Um, I'm now an alumni of care for it's been about two years, maybe three years now. Um, and in my time in care, um, I was closeted as a queer person. Um, queer is a reclaimed word at this point that in the past has been a derogatory term, but is now being used as a term that helps as an umbrella term, such as um, gender nonconforming use. Uh, so that way, that maybe they don't identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, which has to do with sexuality. It is a term to use in relation to their gender. Um, so I just wanted to share the link here at Foster Club. Uh, recently, Foster Club did a campaign um, for foster equality, and so you can read more about my story there and other foster youth alumni story about being LGBTQ in foster care and what can be done to better services and things like that. Um, so the reason that I'm sharing my story is why is it important to support LGBTQ youth? Um, youth need safe spaces, such as placements and people, in my time in care, um, I had great placements. I think foster care for me, for the most part, was great. But conversations were never safely had about what is my sexuality or my gender and do I feel like I can safely share that and still have a home and still have a family. Um, I did not feel that way. And so I found family in a church. And from that, I actually lost that family when I decided to be true to who I am and foster care um, wasn't really able to support that also as I have a transgender father. And I think it was mostly just the fact that it's an, it was an uncomfortable topic that we're still learning how to discuss and how to work better with a population that we just aren't as educated as we could be. Um, and this is important in helping you have safe spaces. Um, the inclusion to experience normalcy is important to foster youth because the fact that having normal lives um, you, a youth should feel included, and a youth knows when they're being excluded, when they feel like they're different. It's even harder to be out and open about who you are when you feel like you can't be included or you don't feel normal. Um, I know that that was something for me that I tried to stick to what normal is by appearing to be straight, even though that was not who I was. Um, acceptance. This is different from tolerance. Um, the Matthew Shepard Foundation talks about this sometimes about the fact that there's tolerance, which you could see as some, it's, you know, it's an effort for you to tolerate someone versus acceptance, which means whether or not I agree with you, I accept it as you are. Um, and that's something that any youth, regardless of race, sexuality, gender, should be able to experience. Um, protection and prevention from bullying. This has been in the national spotlight lately especially, but it's important to remember that these youth specifically are a minority that coupled with other identities, they are highly at risk to be bullied, um, and they need the protection and prevention from that so they can grow up without having these traumas impact their whole lives. Um, I know that I've experienced things that probably would not have happened had I felt safe enough to say who I am and what was happening to me. Um, prevention of further trauma and shame. Just by youth going into foster care, they experience a significant amount of trauma by leaving their family and entering into an unknown system. On top of that, there is shame, potentially, from being known as a foster youth or being known as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. The next important thing to understand is that it takes a village, that saying, you know, it takes community to support a youth, whether or not they are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Um, for me, I know that I would not be who I am if it wasn't for the community that surrounded me as I was growing up. And finally, I would say that the, abil the ability to develop your identity, a foster youth identity, is very important because they are growing up just like any other youth. When you think about normalcy and permanency and all of those things, having the ability to become who you are without those limits and those barriers and shame and all of those things are very, very important to any youth becoming who they really can be. So I would encourage you to think about, as we go through this webinar, who are the youth that you work with and you know that probably don't feel safe enough to do this now or may need more support to be able to do that, to become who they truly are and become great youth? I'll turn it back over to Taffy now. Thank you so much, Emmy, and I really appreciate you being willing to share your story and give us some important thoughts about and that really encourage us um, about why it, this is an important issue that we need to address and, and be open and honest about the work that still needs to be done. 
But with that, we're going to hear from one project that has spent a lot of time to focus on how to do some of the improvement work that needs to happen. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Parrish. Thanks, Taffy. Hi, this is Lisa Parrish. I'm from the LA LGBT Center, and I'm the project director for the RISE Research Project. Um, RISE is a public-private collaboration. The LA LGBT Center was awarded the five-year Permanency Innovations Initiative grant that we call the RISE Project in late 2010. There were six PI grantees, as we call the Permanency Innovations Initiative, selected. Um, our goal has been to design, implement, and evaluate interventions to increase permanency for LGBTQ children and youth involved in the child welfare system. Uh, since they've been identified as a population at higher risk for long-term foster care. Um, RISE is led by the LA LGBT Center with County Departments of Child, Children and Family Services and Mental Health and private foster care agency partners. Uh, the project's in its fifth year. We anticipate extending into a sixth to have time to finish data collection and reporting. Next slide. The RISE project uh, consists of three parts. RISE commissioned a foster youth survey led by the UCLA Williams Institute, which was completed in late 2013 and published in 2014. And this, this report is called Sexual and Gender Minority Youth in Foster Care, Assessing Disproportionality and Disparities in Los Angeles. Um, we've also created an organizational level intervention component consisting of training and coaching for adults who work with LGBTQ youth in the child welfare system. Uh, which we call Outreach and Relationship Building, has a nifty acronym we like to throw around. We call it the ORB. Um, and we've also created a child and family level intervention component in which RISE provides direct care coordination services to children and youth in the child welfare system and their families. Um, while we don't have time to get into many details about the foster youth survey uh, findings, the report is available online. Here's some key points. We used a random sample of about 3,000 potential contacts of the roughly 8,000 youth in foster care in LA, ages 12 and older. And almost 800 youth completed the 20-minute confidential telephone survey. Um, we found that over 13% identified as LGB or Q, and an astonishing 5.6% identified as transgender. In total, over 19% identified as LGBT or Q, which is almost one in five respondents. And this is clear overrepresentation of this population, and it means that there are likely one and a half to two times as many of LGBTQ youth in foster care in Los Angeles as are estimated to be living outside of foster care. And like other youth in foster care in LA, over 90% are Latino, black, or multiracial. A couple more data points from the foster youth survey. Almost 38% of the LGBTQ identified youth reported experiencing discrimination related to their LGBT identity or their gender expression. LGBTQ youth had a higher number of placements. They had more hospitalizations for emotional reasons rather than physical health reasons and were twice as likely to be placed in a group home. These findings support the reasoning behind developing LGBTQ support and competencies for the child welfare system and services that meet their unique and individualized needs and reduce the bias and disparities in their experiences. I want to just quickly mention two other reports which are relevant to this population. The Midwest Evaluation of the Adult Functioning of Former Foster Youth, known as the Midwest Study, which follows a sample of youth aging out of foster care in three states found that 11% of participants identified as LG or B. And the report that Taffy mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, released in 2014 by the Administration for Children and Families Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, the report called Human Services for Low-Income and At-Risk LGBT Populations, surveyed the knowledge base about LGBT young people in the child welfare system and made recommendations about further research needs very similar to the type of research around appropriate interventions that we're doing here in the RISE project, and also uh, called for more collection of data uh, in safe, probably confidential ways about the proportion of this population in out-of-home care. 
I'm going to change gears here and tell you some more about our care coordination services. And this is what I'll focus on for the rest of my brief presentation. Um, RISE has set up four care coordination teams based on an adapted version of uh, the wraparound team-based care coordination approach. Each of our teams is led by a facilitator who coordinates planning and service delivery with a youth specialist and a parent partner. Our parent partners actually often describe themselves as family advocates since they work with extended family members and with caregivers. Our idea was to recruit folks for this role who were the parents of an LGBT child and who had some experience with the service systems that we work with. We know that often a key support for the parents and family members of an LGBT youth is knowing another parent or family member and being able to process with them. The role of the youth specialist is to work with their client on their personal goals, their sense of self, identity, well-being, and their relationships. And uh, RISE also has two clinicians and a family finding coordinator who work with the four teams. The clinician holds sessions with clients and, and oftentimes with uh, parents. Um, and the family finding coordinator works to identify, contact, and engage extended family members and other significant adults, we call them chosen family, who are important to the young person. Um, the RISE staff's job is to form a thoroughly engaged child and family team combining the professional staff around the child, family members, and other natural supporters, and to work to reduce the risk of staying in long-term foster care or entering foster care and achieving safe and stable permanency. I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, the children who are eligible. We tried to keep the eligibility criteria very, very broad, um, so uh, any child or youth who's LGBTQ or gender nonconforming, uh, ages 5 to 19, uh, who has an open child welfare case in Los Angeles, whether they're in uh, out-of-home care or they're still at home with their family. Um, they can also be duly involved with the probation system, uh, but we aren't able to serve kids in locked settings. We really are designed as a community-based, family-focused intervention. Um, I'll say just a little bit uh, about our essential functions and, and the goal. Um, this should look very familiar to those of you who've worked with core practice models and uh, child welfare. Um, we use, we have identified the domains of collaborative teaming, engagement that's culturally informed, respectful and ongoing, and the strategy of basing planning, education, and service delivery on the strengths and needs of the youth and their family and adult supporters. And what's particular to our adaptation is the addition of um, the promising practice of expanding family connections, which we refer to as family finding and engagement. And then most importantly, we interweave strategies to reduce family rejection and increase support of LGBT identity in the network of adults around the young person. The goal for the kids in our care coordination services is uh, both emotional and legal permanence, a uh, safe, stable family for life. Um, the next diagram is a depiction of the essential functions as they play out over the phases of our care coordination process. Um, our phases look like those typically seen in wraparound programs. We start with preparation and teaming. We make initial contacts with uh, caseworkers and the client and make safety plans with LGBT identity as a focus. The youth specialists will meet one-on-one -on -one with the client. The parent partners will meet with the caregiver or family members or other significant adults in the young person's life. And the team will gather information about the case and the adults involved and hold a first team meeting where the youth gets to really choose the adults they want to involve in initial meetings. The next phase um, begins uh, engagement when the regular team meetings are taking place uh, and the team completes a vision statement with the young person for the work to be done, spends time focusing on the client's strengths and needs, and maps their adult connections in family and community maps. Discovery is coordinated by our family finder to identify at least 40 known family connections, including chosen family. Uh, key in the preparation and engagement phases is careful discussion with the young person about who they feel Space disclosing their LGBT identity to or being around if they're already out, and preparing them for discussions about their identity. One-on-ones um, -on continue, an initial plan of care is created, and then we go into phase three or the implementation plan of the phase. 
this is the longest phase during which the team's objective is to expand the network of adults in active contact, to engage them to participate in regular planning meetings, one-on-ones continue. There are many discussions with the client about who they'd like to be closer to and what level of acceptance, support, or rejection is present in that relationship. There's often education needed about LGBT identity for caregivers, for clients, for family members. And during this phase, the team's objective is to engage as many adults as possible, get 10 of them in active contact and attending team meetings, and identify three potential permanency resources. We've created two tools, a short list of behaviors key to the integration of the child's LGBT identity into family life, and a short list of indicators of an emotionally permanent relationship. And we use these concepts to assess the level of LGBT support an adult offers and the probable durability of the emotional connection. The team gets to phase four, transition, when a permanency resource emerges as the adult or family member willing to make a lifelong commitment to the young person's future. And then we transition uh, out of that case with, a, of course, uh, a transition plan. Well, that was a long description of what we do. Uh, I am a New Yorker, and I talk really fast, so I hope that wasn't too fast. Um, I just want to wrap up here for the last five or so minutes talking about what the work's been like. We've reached our care coordination target capacity of 40 youth uh, enrolled in March. It took us 18 months from our first enrollment to get to that target capacity. Referrals were really, really, really slow, which we think is a, another manifestation of the level of bias and kind of heteronormative bias in the system. Um, our teams have caseloads of 10 kids each and uh, are driving all over the 4,000 square miles of Los Angeles County. Clients in group homes. We have clients in different types of foster homes. We have clients placed with relatives. And we have some clients who are living at home with their families. Um, our clients range in, range in age from 6 to 19 years old. And for the most part, they're older teens. They share the racial and ethnic characteristics of all the youth in care in Los Angeles. They're over half Latino and over 35% black and multiracial. They span a spectrum of sexual orientations and gender identities. Um, we're moving into our last year of services, and we have a federal evaluator who are performing data collection on our enrollees. Um, the results of their descriptive study will probably be available in late 2016. Um, I'd like to move into just some key observations about what this work has been like for our teams with the young people and their family members. Um, as I said, referrals were very, very slow to come in, so the teams kind of started slow. And of course, as you might predict, a lot of our early referrals were for kids who were 17, almost 18, and almost aging out of the system or aging into extended foster care here in Los Angeles. Um, and many of them were in group home placements. Um, and at first, our teams were very, very, very protective of the young people, really fearing re-traumatization, the rejection of their orientation, identity, or expression. And therefore, the teams were very cautious about reaching out to any identified family members who weren't identified as already supportive or affirming. The good news was that the teams actually excelled at youth engagement and affirmation and encouraged a lot of youth voice in the process of expanding their family connections. Um, but the teams were just very slow to develop the network of support that we thought should be existing out there for all of these youth, given the background that we've had in doing family finding and family engagement work. Um, what really happened was the youth's immediate needs came first for the teams, and they spent a lot of time, as we do in child welfare, putting out fires and helping with education and transportation and all of the kind of basic immediate needs. Um, so we really had to put a lot of effort in coaching our team members to step back and take the long-term view. Um, and what was going on was that they had to spend really months developing relationships with these young people and what we call unpacking the no unpacking the reasons why the young people themselves were hesitant to reach out to uh, extended family members or other adults uh, they were interested in having closer relationships with. Um, the good news was that we, we got to a turning point, um, and 
uh, over time, um, our teams were very, very good at the youth engagement. The young people felt validated, and they reported feeling much more comfortable in their identity, reported feeling uh, more comfortable sharing their identity, talking about it with folks, and there were clear markers that their well-being improved. One example of this is a story that I'll tell of a, a young person who came out as transgender while we were working with them. Um, and our teams are very, very careful when they first engage with clients to stress the importance of using appropriate gender pronouns and to introduce themselves um, and use the pronouns they use to identify with. And for this particular young person, this was the first time that anyone had spoken to them in this manner, and they were able to fairly quickly in their relationship with their team come out as transgender, and this really was a turning point for them. The team then had to spend a good bit of time working with the staff at the group home that this young person was in, um, educating them uh, about the importance to the young person of identifying in the gender they were transitioning to. And as you can imagine, there were staff in the group home who were uncomfortable with this and found it difficult to use the appropriate gender pronouns. But over time, after modeling and after really the staff in the group home observing the improvement in the young person's well-being, um, as they were able to transition, um, the entire group home came around and there really was a, a great, great positive reinforcement for this young person, which enabled the team to then begin working with the young person on adult contacts. And this took, you know, about six months to get to the place where the, this young person was actively meeting with potential foster home placements um, and had a very positive experience. So sort of six months into these cases as we're growing the family networks, um, the families and the caregivers that we were working with also began to feel really validated. Um, our parent partners really get in there and uh, work with people from where they're at and really focus on the education around LGBT identity. Um, there are a particular couple of tools that we found very useful in this work um, in working directly with adults around the young people. And those are a tool that's available on the Internet. We call it the genderbred person, in which we help educate people about the different components of identity, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, biological sex, and helping the adults um, really uh, differentiate these concepts turned out to be a really important part of the parent partner's work. Um, we also use um, materials from the Family Acceptance Project in San Francisco, uh, the organization that hired the work around reducing family rejection and increasing family acceptance for LGBT young adults. And those materials showing the health and mental health risks for young people who experience rejection are very powerful with family and adults. Uh, extended family members. Um, and I'll give you just a very quick story about a grandma who uh, was really, really confused and concerned that her grandchild would not come out to her even though they were living in the same home together. This was a very respectful young person who simply did not want to discuss his identity with his grandmother. And after some time with our parent partner spending time with the grandma and explaining that this wasn't a sign of disrespect or a sign of shame about identity, that it was really fear of rejection, the grandma completely turned around, opened up and said in a number of meetings with her grandchild an incredible amount of loving and courageous um, and supportive statements about their identity. The young person was very overcome and they are working on bringing other family members uh, along the supportive end of the spectrum. So that was just a, a really specific example of certain tools that we you can use in our family education. The other thing that I'll bring up um, is that we spend a lot of time with our staff unpacking adult knows why adults don't want to be more engaged, be more active with their young, their family members. And we've, we've learned to be very strategic in identifying the most effective messengers for messages around support. And an example about this was a, a family that we've been working with 
um, where an aunt came into a family meeting and talked about the loss of her child and how she would give anything to have her child back today uh, as a way to kind of uh, reawaken the family to the importance of supporting their child unconditionally. Um, I'm just going to wrap up and say a couple of things about, you could go on to the next slide. Um, what we've learned so far in this work around our team-based approach that I think might be helpful for others to think about, clearly as I've just talked about, um, having this kind of youth specialist uh, really engaged on working with the young person around their identity, around safety planning, around coming out, uh, preparing them for acceptance as well as rejection, uh, helping them through their process has been very, very important and helping them um, around healthy relationships. The other thing, and this was part of our theory going into this, was that we thought that having a family advocate, we've been calling them parent partners, but they really turn out to work with caregivers and other family members as well, um, has been enormously, enormously successful. And they've been able to help really educate extended family members and really help them through their part of the coming out process and coming to terms with their family member's identity. Um, we've had our first uh, five graduations from our program in the last few months. Um, three of them were reunifications. One case, we had an 18-year-old who's in a very, very supportive uh, supervised independent living placement as she's in extended foster care um, with a very, very supportive lesbian foster um, couple. Um, and then we have another 18-year-old who is living with a former foster mom. We have another uh, set of graduations coming up in the next few months, and we'll be finishing up this work in probably early 2016. I think that's all I'm going to have to say today, so I'm going to turn this back over to Taffy. Well, thank you, Lisa, for all of that great information and Congratulations on the five existing graduations, the upcoming graduations, and I just want to make folks aware that part of the grant um, that they're working through had one year of uh, planning and development so that they could get set up. Um, so in a couple of years' time, they've been able to uh, successfully work with a number of youth um, towards having permanency and connections that they may have not all otherwise had. So this is uh, an important example, I think, of really putting a very thoughtful and strategic program together to address the needs of LGBTQ youth. And uh, with that, I'd like to transition us towards a child welfare system's work with Juliana Harms. Thank you so much, Taffy. I appreciate that. And also, a thank you to Emmy and to Lisa for their invaluable information. Um, I'm glad I, I think that I can't be seen because I'm in my office nodding my head as everybody's talking, thinking, yeah, yeah, that is so important. And those are, are key pieces of information that we need to highlight regarding our youth and how we serve as advocates in the child welfare system. So my points today um, will include a, just a very brief description of Illinois and what we are as a child welfare agency. And then talking about the genesis of our LGBTQ program and what really started that, what was the spark moving us to the point of where we are now and essentially our future planning, but also some of the lessons that we've learned along the way and that we, uh, again, as a very organic program, know that we need to incorporate to better advocate for our youth. So Illinois is a state agency. We have one director. We are not a county-based system, although we do have field offices throughout the state to cover multiple county jurisdictions. And we have quite a population diversity within our state. We are 102 counties. Our smallest population by census is approximately 2,000 people, but then we move to our more 
urban setting, of course, everybody knows about Chicago, and that has up to 5 million people, and obviously a wide variety of resources, of um, opportunities that are available from any sort of education to involvement to group work. Our staff within our offices are a combination of administrative management and service delivery personnel. And we have individuals from the divisions of child protection, our permanency, which is our, our placement, our, our foster care division, intact services, and support programs. Our support programs include licensing, monitoring functions, legal, budget, finance, our clinical division, which is uh, what I'm a part of. I am actually the administrator of social work practice for the department, and I'm housed within our clinical division. And I felt it was important to describe what our offices look like and what our state looks like so you have an idea of what our outreach is and the intent of our information sharing and, again, our advocacy for our LGBT youth. And describing our youth in care, um, obviously the number of youth in care at any one time is a moving target. And, uh, and actually, we can transition to the next slide. And there we go. Illinois has approximately 17,000 youth in care at this point. That can vary, and it, uh, it obviously is an ever-changing number. We serve youth ages 0 to 21, and we do have placement throughout the state with relatives, traditional foster care, specialized foster care, adolescent care, group home, and residential facilities. So obviously our levels of care have different supports connected with them. But we also have a strong partnership with private agencies, our purchase of service providers. And our private agencies do serve approximately 80% of the children in foster care in Illinois. So I need to make sure that that is a point of emphasis because while we might be making changes and movement within Illinois' Department of Children and Family Services, we are also creating that nexus with our private agency partners so that we have equanimity and performance. We also have 24 different court jurisdictions that oversee our juvenile court cases, and this is especially important for our youth and our LGBT youth because each court system brings a unique perspective with regard to youth identity, um, youth verbalization of identity, and the fluidity that is sometimes attached to that. Talking about the origin of the department's LGBT policy is, is exciting for me because I was actually in a um, direct service supervisory role when I saw our first policy transmittal issued regarding how the department was going to support LGBT youth in care. And I felt that we were making strides to work with an underserved population. And again, it was, uh, I think, a point of change within the department that was quite significant. Illinois was the first child welfare agency in the nation to develop an LGBT youth service policy. And we created this after recognizing that there were an increasing number of LGBT youth in the care of the department. And at that time, and this is in the early 2000s, our director said, we need to create a policy that addresses the, the needs of youth. And in 2003, discussions started regarding the needs of these youth, and it included our department administration. We have contractual psychologists who are also a part of this. Lambda Legal was represented, and we also had state legislators who are strong allies of the LGBT population. So discussion ensued, and our first policy was crafted. And it was a very simple policy. It was uh, it contained some research, but the primary premise was do no harm. And 
It also provided do's and don'ts for interventions with our LGBTQ youth in substitute care. And it is a circumstance that led us to move from pathology or a deficits-based uh, bias that sometimes is, is held within uh, a larger society to recognizing that these are youth who might require extra supports during their time in care because of that pushback from heteronormative society. So we can actually transition to the next slide. I'm, I'm touching on some of those points at this point, at this time. At the point of creation of the policy, our deputy of uh, our clinical division, who is a licensed psychologist, and other clinical personnel provided best practice training to the department and to the private agency partners that I had mentioned. And this is really our grassroots effort to do outreach, to offer education and resources for staff where resources perhaps had not previously been available. And individual consultation was available. And fortunately, at this point, the out-of-the-margins listening forums were taking place. And um, this is, again, a very valuable resource if you can take a look at the listening forums and it's feedback from youth who are in care and youth who have um, essentially not received the services that they need. These are their own words. So at this point, with regard to training and practice development within the department, the LGBT advocacy work was formalized into an LGBTQ program within the clinical division, and it's within our specialty services group. We have specific statewide, um, a specific statewide coordinator position, and this person is dedicated to consultation, education, resource development. This is a go-to person who can do outreach, who can meet with the youth, meet with casework staff, investigative staff, anybody who might identify a need within a family system or with regard to a youth, and again, serve as that anchor for evidence-based practice, for resource linkage, or for working through transitions. We are also fortunate to have an ongoing partnership with a DCFS psychologist for training and consultation. And our psychologist is dedicated to her work with our LGBT population. She's out. She is a terrific mentor, an example of uh, a person who is living true to herself. And our youth respond very favorably to that. We also have a statewide LGBT resource guide that is ever-changing. We always work to update. We make that available to casework staff, to anybody who might need to tap into resources throughout the state. We also, within our training realm and within our practice development, have at the point of entry into the department as a staff person, either within DCFS or private agency, our foundations training, which does include LGBT education, Again, uh, some myth busting and some fact presentations. We are working to continue our ongoing community partnerships. We have a close relationship with our guardian ad litem, our public guardian in the Cook County area, and also ally groups throughout the state. We had an updated policy guide created in 2009, and again, it was solidifying information that was presented in research and presented a heightened awareness of what our LGBT youth rights were. And my next slide will show an excerpt from our policy transmittal. And again, this is the written emphasis of the legal rights of youth in care, the right to be free of harassment, and the ability to express gender identity and have the choice to be open about sexual orientation. So it's extremely important to make sure that that information was in writing so that 
again, practice expectations are established for individuals who are providing care to youth, but also it's a message to the youth that they are being treated with respect and that their identity is honored. And I wanted to take a second to talk about where we are now and how we work with our consultations regarding LGBT youth. You'll see on the slide that I have noted the expansion of the title of our LGBTQ programming, and I wanted to make sure that the policy work that we had and the outreach that we were doing would be available to anybody who came in contact with the department. And also, uh, it incorporated work with intersex youth and adults. So our LGBTQI Youth and Families program um, is what we're known as now. We were missing some of the population we were coming in contact with during investigations or intact families, so this makes outreach more available. One point that we are acknowledging is that there's an increasing number of transgender youth in care, gender expressive, gender nonconforming, and it became apparent that we needed to explore the focus for the, the care of, of trans youth or trans exploring youth. And um, we are building updates to our policy to address this. We also have dedicated efforts by our resource recruitment program that's dedicated to securing LGBTQ affirming placement resources and developing foster care resources within the LGBT community. We also have um, a significant relationship with our Cook County and Collar Court Systems especially with regard to our trans youth and recognition of identity. The court is very respectful of youths who are identifying uh, not within their biological constraints but by their true gender, and it's quite affirming for the youth to be able to talk about their legal circumstances and have that respected uh, by gender. We also had the benefit of working with Dr. Gary Mallon, who is an incredible resource, and he is the person, along with allies within the department, that allowed or who allowed us to move our policy to the next level, to, again, be more inclusive of the trans needs and more expansive with regard to the outreach regarding youth rights. And again, this is, this is a step that we are taking to ensure that youth who are in the care of the department, whether it's foster care on up to our residential facilities, know that they have rights that need to be uh, enforced, respected, and that they can be safe in care. And this also moves towards permanency and stability for youth. We have cross-divisional efforts to support LGBT placement and placement according to gender identification. This is where our permanency piece comes in. We are moving youth from the island. We're moving them out of a silo of, oh, we have somebody who has come out or is questioning. They need to be in A, B, or C constraints. And we recognize that we have to re-anchor our children with their community, with their families, or with chosen families. So Lisa's work is especially poignant when it comes to that work with chosen families and also educating families of origin. We have been fortunate to establish a relationship with medical professionals. Um, Dr. Rob Garofalo has created the Lurie Gender, Children's Gender and Sex Development Program in Chicago, available to all youth throughout the state. Great social-emotional resource, um, also provides guard guidance regarding health care for trans youth, and we have the unique role of our DCFS guardian in critical decisions for youth. I believe Illinois is the only state with a single guardian who is charged with making decisions for youth. So this is especially important when we're talking about housing, when we're talking about the uh, health needs of trans youth, etc. We are 
moving toward listening forums, again, um, on an Illinois-specific level to hear what our LGBT youth are stating. We also project doing a survey of youth in care, which is also exciting to hear what Lisa had to present regarding that. We're working with the Illinois Coalition on Youth because we recognize that many of our LGBT youth are represented, unfortunately, in the homeless population, obviously up to approximately 40%. So our ICOI staff are focusing on the prevention of youth homelessness and are tackling the needs of LGBT um, youth and young adults in care. We have a wide variety of resources throughout the state. Um, it's a circumstance where we recognize our more urban centers have those, those group sites, the health care, the, um, the social interaction spots that are available to youth that might not be available downstate. That's where our coordinator comes in to search out and to try to link um, youth individuals' families with affirming groups. We are creating a standalone training that can be accessed by all DCFS staff and private agency partners. And we are also working on developing more youth-friendly information resources so that, again, this is part of that welcome mat for our youth in care. There is you know, specific information that is shared that is particular to them. One youth said to me, all I want is to be around like-minded people. And that's what we need to deliver, healthy relationship information, um, guides for anything that might be in a youth's mind. And we're still addressing the challenges of creating change in a state agency and adjusting a binary system for non-binary youth. We recognize that our youth are anywhere along a spectrum with regard to identity, uh, searching out their own identity, how they are outwardly identifying, not wanting to force a youth to state, this is who I am and I will never change, but to recognize that there is a point of transition and as an agency we need to go with it. We need to recognize that, that change is a part of development. We do have some protections in place within Illinois, and uh, you'll see that I, I love the title of this slide, People First, Legal Protections for Diversity, because we often remove people from the work we do even though we're a human service profession. The Illinois Human Rights Act does prohibit discrimination for sexual orientation, and that's something exceptionally important. Again, a part of advocacy for our children, but also for caregivers and interveners to recognize there is a responsibility to advocate and to treat and to provide services. Sorry, that's my timer. To provide services that are needed by our youth in care. Illinois gay marriage was signed into effect in 2013, but the law took effect on June 1st, 2014, that was quite a celebration and quite a, um, a movement. And we actually have a new proposed protection act. It's the Youth Mental Health Protection Act. And actually there's a point of summary on our next slide. And it was actually just introduced this year and it creates the protection regarding conversion therapy or sexual orientation change efforts. So this is still very active, and it actually has been re-referred to our rules committee within the state, but we are keeping a close eye on that. This is something that's already built into our policy, so we're anxious to see what happens on the statewide level as a law. So again, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to everybody and to be able to hear the information from Emmy and from Lisa. And Taffy, I transition back to you. Well, thank you very much. I think that Illinois is definitely doing a lot of work in this area, and I appreciate the fact that you talked about it being progressively building um, throughout the past numerous years. I think that's important to note um, that you've started somewhere and you've built from that. 
and so I really appreciate your time on the webinar. At this point, we will go ahead and turn it back to Emmy. All right. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to kind of wrap up some of what we've talked about and where we can head now. Um, I would add to that that I'm not an expert necessarily. I'm speaking from my own personal experience and also things that I've been educated in. I'm studying women, gender, sexuality, queer studies at Portland State. And so that is where my background comes from. So if something is missing here, please feel free to either ask questions or um, look into more information when you have questions about that because it is hard to cover all of this in this webinar for sure. So how can workers be more supportive? So it is important that we support youth in a youth-led, youth-driven, or youth-centered plan and process. Um, when that happens, usually, not always, but usually we're able to better support what youth want or need or say they need rather than saying we know what they want and what they need and we're going to do this. Um, it's also important because we need to be willing to ask questions like what are your pronouns or how do you identify? Earlier, we, I talked about using the term queer. Um, when a youth says that they want to use the term queer when they identify, then you can say, um, what does that mean, or how do, we, how do you want me to use that? It's important to know that queer isn't necessarily a term that everyone should go around using comfortably. You should make sure you're educated about why you're using that term, um, especially with the history behind the term being derogatory in some, um, in some areas, but knowing does that youth want to be identified as she, her, he, him, or they, them, and other terms that are actually out there that are less common um, but are becoming more known. It's important to also know the difference between sexuality and gender, so I know that I'm talking to a youth about them being a lesbian or um, a gay person versus knowing that they're transgender or two-spirit or intersex. And we'll talk a little bit more about those terms in a minute. Um, so remember that sexuality and gender are not a youth's life. It's not all that they're about, clearly. So don't focus in on that and then only talk to them as if that's all that's in their life. Um, because then that also kind of makes them feel uncomfortable for sure. Go beyond cultural sensitivity. A lot of organizations have their, you know, cultural sensitivity training, but it's not just about, like, sitting through a training and knowing that you should go beyond that. Get to know a youth. They are going to be different than other youth, and whatever specific to them is probably how you should interact with them. Um, and meet youth where they are. Youth um, come from different places, and one day they might be feeling one way, and another day they could be feeling an entirely different way. Um, and also realize that even if the youth seems like they're totally good and they're okay, those could also be the youth that you miss, that even though they seem like they're an okay youth, like myself, I was a youth that my kids would go like, you're good, we don't have to worry about you, but there was questions and things missed there that could have been discussed had they not just seen me as the youth that's got everything taken care of. On the next slide... Um, we can talk about how can caregivers and their families be more supportive. Um, create a space of acceptance and support. So make it feel like at home the youth is accepted as they are. You're not just tolerating their identity, their gender identity or their sexuality, but support them in understanding that, even if you're having a hard time understanding that, which goes into taking the time to understand perspectives. Um, as a worker, as a caregiver, as a family member, it can be hard to understand where they're coming from because everyone has their different perspectives. But it's important to try and understand it. You don't necessarily have to agree with it, but just try to understand where they're coming from. Um, assess their individual needs. This is something we should always be doing, but still remembering that one youth is going to be different than another. So don't try and put other youth things on another youth. Um, educate family members. Don't make this the youth's responsibility. This is really important. Try to understand what's going on by what the youth is saying, but don't make it the youth's responsibility to tell your family or others what's going on. That's undue harm and just more responsibility than they're probably ready for, unless they say, yeah, I want to tell them what I'm thinking, what's going on, or what this means. But really be a team in that so that you're not putting um, a bunch of weight on them that they're not ready for. Protect their vulnerability. These are really vulnerable youth. They can be, at least, because on top of being foster youth, they're also trying to understand their identity in a world that versus a city and a rural landscape can be very different, very accepting or unaccepting. So try to protect them when they want to share something about themselves and things like that because they might not know what could happen. Um, talks don't hide. So talk to them about what's going on. Don't hide from the situation or ignore it like it's not there. It's there, and they'll know when you're doing that. 
Um, it makes them feel more open to tell you what they're thinking and what's going on, and you'll usually get your answers, your questions answered, and you'll learn a lot more than you realize you could. On the next slide, what can agencies do? So number one would be bring youth to the table. Right now I'm here having this discussion with you all because a youth was brought to the table, but there's so many youth in every state. I am obviously not the only queer youth that is out there. So go in your state and say, who is here? Who do we need to be talking to to make this happen? Um, that will get you a lot farther in this work. Train your workforce on LGBTQ vocabulary, current issues, practices, and et cetera. It's an ongoing training. This stuff is changing all the time. There's stuff that I go to class that I learned about, and I was like, that already changed? Like, I just learned about this thing. Um, and so in that scenario, you can imagine that in a workforce, that could change and need to be updated even more. Um, different terms like two-spirit, I did not know for a long time, but two-spirit has to do with indigenous and native people in America and in their belief system. Um, and that's something that not everyone knows about. And then there's intersex. What does that mean? What does asexual mean? Can someone be asexual? How do we take that use seriously? Like, these are questions that a workforce needs to know and understand to be able to better work with these youth. Train and work with caregivers, such as relatives especially. Don't just train foster parents, but also train relatives to know about their youth because they may just need someone to tell them what's going on because they're just really confused. Establish and implement policies and procedures based on youth experience. So policy and procedures get pushed all the time, but if they're not pushed with the understanding of the experiences that they're coming from and the youth voice, they probably are going to miss the mark. But don't just put in policies. Make sure there's actual procedures. What are people supposed to do with these? What can they do with these so things can get done? Openly and positively discuss LGBTQ youth and common issues. Be willing to talk about these things openly, but also positively. It's not just a negative thing. It should be able to, you should be able to talk about these things so everyone can share whatever they want, even if it's good or it's bad. But then end things on a positive note. Like, we're trying to work on this. We're trying to understand these things so that youth can come forward and say, this is who I am, and I'm really glad that we're at least talking about it. Even if we're not doing it perfectly, we're talking about it. Consider using peers. Representation is important. When a youth sees a queer worker, they will probably understand that that person is out, that person is in a place where everyone else is seeing them. Maybe one day I can be doing that too. That is really important. Um, so be willing to consider that. And then also an idea would be to recruit homes specific to queer youth. This is something I've seen in Portland where queer parents um, open up their homes to queer foster youth. It's not always possible, but it is an idea or an option so that queer youth are in a place where they're like, well, I know my parent, I know where my foster parents stand on this. I can be a little bit more open here and safe about it rather than just putting youth in any home. Um, so now I'll turn it back over to Taffy so we can talk about more of this. So thank you, Amy. I think that that is a very nice way to remind us of some of the specifics um, that agencies, caregivers, and workers can do um, in the background of the information that Juliana and Lisa provided. I think at this time, uh, we're going to go ahead and go through the questions uh, that were sent in through the chat feature. Um, and actually, we had a couple of questions around the terms and definitions, uh, but I believe that uh, Juliana and uh, Emmy just now provided some good information uh, on that area. So we will go ahead and move on to a couple of others. Uh, Lisa, these uh, are going to be for you. There's a couple of questions around the parent partner. Uh, and so uh, one question is, is the parent partner term, is that necessarily a parent or not? Um, good question. We started out looking for parents of LGBT youth, um, and particularly ones who had experience with the child welfare system or the mental health system. Uh, this turned out to be actually not the easiest thing to find, as many of you could probably relate to. Um, so I think... Um, Generally, the idea, we've ended up with kind of a combination of people, um, uh, all of whom have a 
connection to the LGBT community, whether they're a member themselves or they have a child who's a member. Um, all of our parent partners are parents. Um, we actually have a couple who previously were teachers. Um, and I think the key concept for me has been that this notion of someone who can identify with family members, with grandmothers, with aunts, with uncles, with um, with parents, uh, with step-parents, with chosen parents. Um, I think you're, you're looking for someone who probably doesn't look like your generic child welfare worker, you know, and but, but, by which I mean, you know, someone who's sort of family-focused. Um, we had a hard time filling these positions when we were first saying we were really trying to only have parents of LGBT kids. We have a number of them now, um, and the sort of word of mouth has helped. Um, let me stop there. Okay, thank you. We have a, a couple of other questions for you in that uh, field. Um, are partner parents and youth specialists paid positions as part of the team, or are they voluntary? They are paid positions in our care coordination team. Great. And one other question on that piece is, who are the essential members of the collaborative team? Does that include law enforcement? We haven't yet had a, a circumstance in which a law enforcement member would be part of a team. Uh, so, But we think of the team very broadly. Uh, uh, however, we really want the young person to view it as their team, and so they have a lot of input about who they would like present at meetings and who they want to feel closer to. And could you uh, repeat uh, some of the members that you mentioned, that there might be others that are essential members of the team? Sure. Um, so we have on staff, uh, as part of the team, a facilitator, a youth specialist, and a, a parent partner or family advocate, as they often call themselves. But the team is really would include the child caseworker um, from the department, a social worker if they have one at their placement facility. We are not a placement program. We are a care coordination program. Um, and then adults that the young person feels close to and cl clearly anyone who's kind of in line as a permanency resource. Great. And one last question for you. Um, could you repeat the names, the information on the two tools that you had mentioned? Yeah, one tool we use is called the gender bread person, and it's a diagram of a person that looks like a gingerbread person. And it is a tool that differentiates between uh, biological sex, uh, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Um, the other tool that we use are booklets that are um, available from the Family Acceptance Project, which is based in San Francisco, uh, booklets about um, the kind of risk and resilience of LGBT young people and the, the risk of health and mental health problems due to family rejection and the benefit of family acceptance. Thank you. Another question that we have is how can other states implement such programs? And if you all don't mind, I will give a little bit of, of my thoughts around that. Um, certainly, I think from the standpoint of federal support, uh, I would like to see that we will have more opportunities uh, for states and localities to be able to apply for discretionary grants and other fundings that may become available and really encourage you all um, to look for those. Uh, so, for example, the RISE project is a discretionary grant, so there is money that is provided by the Children's Bureau to support the development and implementation of the particular uh, innovations that they've determined that they wanted to work on and also evaluate. There's a lot of work that goes into evaluating um, that grant so that we can have some evidence-based practices at the end of the grant period. And I, I certainly am uh, hoping and believing that we will continue to provide opportunities for those kinds of grants 
um, through the Children's Bureau. And, and in fact, we do have uh, some others at this moment in time um, that also have some level of focus on specifically serving LGBTQ uh, youth. Uh, in addition, uh, by hearing from um, Juliana, you, I hope, got a sense of that state child welfare agencies certainly have the ability to make this a priority and develop their own programs and their own policies and their own training of staff um, around how to be more sensitive to this issue, how to speak with youth about this, how to help really put together services um, that are friendly and uh, supportive of this population. So, um, and I think that one of the points that, that Juliana made is that it has grown over time. Uh, so I think that the the responsibility of child welfare agencies uh, is something that really speaks to that making it a priority and really engaging with the leadership of the agency um, and even with, you know, legislative bodies, et cetera, um, to really give you all the ability to develop these programs and, for example, looking at your licensing uh, regulations and are those friendly or not? How can we make them more inclusive of LGBT families that may want to foster or adopt? So there, is, there are a number of things that we have seen that can be done, some of which would require some level of funding, but many of which don't, and it gives you a starting point. So we hope that you were able to get some good ideas uh, about where to start, and certainly you will uh, use that, the contact information for uh, the presenters today if you want to specifically ask us some additional questions around that. Um, I think uh, one other question that we had, uh, and I think, Emily, you will probably be able to give some information on this, but certainly Lisa and Juliana as well. Uh, the question is, over the last 10 to 15 years, the field has developed a number of uh, resources, including reports, best practice guidelines, training curricula, et cetera, that support LGBTQ youth in care, and you know, developed by numerous organizations, the American Bar Association, the Human Rights Campaign, just to name a couple. So... Um, how have these resources been incorporated into the initiative of RISE, uh, into the work that Illinois uh, Department of Family and, and Children's Services uh, have done? And, Emily, if you would like to also add to that from your perspective. Okay. Well, I would say that, this is Emily, sorry. Um, from my perspective, I would say that um, all Children, All Families from HRC is a curriculum that's been used for, um, so not as mostly just seen as a reference place to start um, because HRC has a platform that's easy, that a lot of people know about. It's easy to hear about them. Um, but I found that a place where things have been incorporated most and that people can also go to find more resources that are LGBTQ specific and then can get more into foster care related um, on college campuses and local communities, generally in bigger cities, of course, there's generally um, queer resource centers or LGBTQ centers or GSAs, and those are places where you can meet with people who may already have those answers of what are the resources or what resources are you using and could also just tell you more about where to start looking and give you those connection points. I know that when I was doing research for this and when I do research for classes, there's a lot more people out there that I realize know about this stuff and what resources are working and what they've tried to use that has not worked. Um, so sometimes it's the people around you or in those positions that have probably worked with someone else who is using that curriculum that points out that maybe all children and all families works, but some other curriculum doesn't hit the mark anymore and just needs to be updated. So I would say that. Great. Lisa or Juliana, would you like to add to that as far as your particular work and if you incorporated um, some of those resources? Kathy, this is Juliana. Um, I, I would have to say absolutely that those evidence-informed research bites and research papers are extremely important um, 
to introduce change, to introduce expectations. We rely heavily in Illinois on the publications by Caitlin Ryan and the Family Acceptance Project, the um, National Center on Lesbian Rights, obviously the Child Welfare League of America. Extremely important to introduce this research and, um, again, experientially what other sites may have gone through when you're working on uh, changing attitudes, changing belief systems, which we still encounter at times within the department when we are also trying to advance a next step with regard to policy, there is heavy reliance on this vetted information. And I can't say a day goes by without putting hands on some sort of a piece of research or looking for additional research to advance the advocacy for the needs of our youth. Uh, this is Lisa, and I'll just second what Juliana just said, and Emmy. You know, there's a tremendous body of work that's been produced over the last 30 years, and, you know, we've relied very heavily on, on looking at all of that, the Model Standards Project, CWLA Best Practice Guidelines, published in 2006, the Moving the Margins Curriculum by NASW and Lambda Legal from 2009, and as I've said, most importantly, I think, the Family Acceptance Project research and educational materials. And pardon the interruption. I'll turn it back to our presenters for closing. That will conclude our question and answer session. Thank you. So I appreciate all of the presenters uh, answering the questions that we had. That was wonderful. And I'm going to talk just briefly uh, about some of our resources uh, where you can find additional information as well as some of the things that we talked about today. So for National Foster Care Month, again, the thing, get to know the many faces of foster care. That is uh, located at https colon backslash backslash www.childwelfare.gov backslash foster care month. And uh, the report that we mentioned earlier, Advancing LGBT Health and Well-Being LGBT Issues Coordinating Committee 2014 report, as well as Human Services for Low-Income and At-Risk LGBT Populations, an assessment of the knowledge base and research needs. Those reports can also be found on the National Foster Care Month website. I am providing my uh, contact information here uh, so that if you've got additional questions or anything that you would like uh, in addition to what we covered today, we know we had a very short time, so it was really a high-level overview, uh, but please feel free to get in touch with me. And so on behalf of the Children's Bureau, we really want to thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, and we also want to encourage you to register for next week. We have an upcoming webinar on the challenges and, successes and successful practices for transitioning youth from congregate care, which on that National Foster Care Month website, uh, you can register through that. And lastly, we encourage you to take our survey for today's webinar. We really look forward to receiving your feedback. And that will be sent out uh, immediately after the webinar. So we hope that you gained useful information today. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you for a great afternoon. Thank you. And once again, that does conclude today's conference. We'd like to thank everyone for their participation. OK, and we are back in a private conference. Let me be the first to say hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I get nervous to be the first one to say anything because if my mouth we would still be on a <laughs> Hey guys, this turned out to be really, really great. I mean, hopefully we met the mark because we didn't have a lot of questions and usually for me. When I see a ton of questions, it really becomes less about 